In today's session, we will be discussing transient visual loss or TVL. TVL is a short lasting episode of visual loss following which the vision comes back to the pre episode level. TVL is not an uncommon presentation in the clinic and certain causes of TVL deserve urgent medical evaluation because they may predict significant morbidity. So TVL is a sudden onset loss of vision and this can happen unilaterally or bilaterally and the loss of vision can be complete or incomplete but by definition that loss of vision lasts for less than 24 hours. So as I have mentioned it is a clinically important history though the patient is usually asymptomatic at presentation because the short lasting episode is already over when the patient visits the ophthalmologist. We characterize a TVL based on certain parameters, the first one being the laterality. Unilateral TVL is due to a prechasmal problem and the most important cause of unilateral TVL is retinal ischemia which is also known as transient retinal ischemia or transient ischemic attack and it happens from a thrombus or an embolus from the carotid circulation. However, certain homonymous bilateral field defects can be described as monocular. Although they are not prechasmal in origin, they are postchasmal in origin. And the patient describes it as monocular in the eye whose temporal field is affected. Bilateral TVL is due to a chiasmal or retrochiasmal issue and the most common cause of bilateral TVL is migraine. However, it can very rarely occur from bilateral simultaneous optic nerve involvement. In an age group above 50 years, we suspect transient retinal ischemia or TIA and in an age group even older, we suspect giant cell arteritis. Giant cell arteritis is a diagnosis which must always be considered. In an younger age group, the causes include migraine including retinal migraine, preeclampsia and hypercoagulable states. So the duration of the ep episode may be very short lasting for seconds as in papilledema, optic disc bruising and occipital scissors or it may last minutes up to 15 minutes but usually 1 to 5 minutes and this happens in TIA, transient retinal ischemia, GCA and papilloflebitis or early CRVO and it is even longer more than 10 minutes up to 30 minutes or even more in migraine and ocular ischemic syndrome. TIA is most commonly described as a curtain coming from above or below in the visual field and obstructing the central vision. It may also be described as a peripheral constriction or even a complete loss of visual field. Sometimes it is associated with contralateral weakness and numbness if the origin is from a severe carotid artery stenosis. In papilledema or an optic distrusion, the TVL can occur with change in posture. And in optic neuritis, the TVL occurs with a rise in body temperature such as with exercise and this is called Utoff's phenomenon. In ocular ischemic syndrome, the TVL also may occur during exercise, change of posture or in bright light. In GCA, as we have seen, it can cause headache, jaw claudication and scalp tenderness. In migraine, there will be positive visual phenomena called aura and headache. In a vertebrobasilar artery tertiary attack, there can be bilateral whiteout or dimming of vision and or constriction of the peripheral fields. This is because in a vertebrobasilar tertiary attack, both halves of the occipital cortex will be involved. In PCA tertiary attack, the patient will complain of loss of vision on only one side. That is because only one occipital cortex or only one half of the occipital cortex will be involved and these may be associated with other brainstem and cerebellar symptoms such as vertigo, diplopia, dysphagia, ataxia, dysarthria and loss of consciousness. Among these, vertigo is the most common. In internal carotid artery dissection, there will be ipsilateral periorbital pain and Horner syndrome. In occipital lobe seizures, there will be positive visual phenomena. In pigment dispersion, there might be visual difficulty during exercise when excess pigment is released from the iris and in dry eye, patients will complain of visual distortion associated with irritation with activities requiring prolonged staring and relieved with blinking. After discussing the laterality, 
the most frequent age of presentation and the symptoms of the various causes of TVL. We will discuss the causes in a little more detail. Starting with the most important cause to consider that is retinal ischemia. It is a vascular induced transient visual loss and is also called transient ischemic attack or amaurosis fugax and it often precedes a cerebrovascular event or a myocardial infarction and that is why it is so important to recognize a TVL from retinal ischemia and send the patient for appropriate evaluation and management. Results of ocular examination is often normal and vascular abnormalities can only rarely be seen when the patient presents to the ophthalmologist. The cause of transient retinal ischemia lies in emboli and carotid artery stenosis. So the types of emboli are cholesterol emboli, platelet fibrin emboli and calcium emboli. Cholesterol emboli are also known as Hollenhorst plaques. They are yellowish orange and refractile and lodges in major retinal artery bifurcation. So they usually lodge where the artery bifurcates. It usually originates from atheromas in the common carotid artery bifurcation. This is an important site of atheroma and internal carotid artery. However, less commonly they may also arise from aortic arch or the innominate artery on the right side. Coming to platelet fibrin emboli, they are usually dull grey-white in color, are mobile and takes the shape of the vessel with concave edges on the proximal and distal side. They may lodge anywhere along the artery, not necessarily at their bifurcations and the platelet fibrin emboli usually originate from hard valves and atheromatous vessels. So I could not find a non-copyrighted image. Please look up at the internet to see an image of a platelet fibrin emboli. And calcium emboli are large and white and lodge in the first or second bifurcation of the retinal arteries and thus are nearer to the optic nerve head and they originate from heart or red vessels, heart being an important source of calcium emboli and they usually arise from rheumatic heart disease, calcific aortic stenosis and calcified mitral valve annulus. Less commonly, emboli may be seen in hypercoagulable states, acute pancreatitis, cardiac tumors and intravasation of fat, air, talc, silicone and deposteroids. Often the emboli can be made more easily visible by applying gentle pressure on the eye, thus making them slightly mobile inside the vessel. Sources of emboli include atheromatous plaques and cardiac sources. Atheromatous plaques commonly occur at the bifurcation of the common carotid artery and the carotid siphon at the anterior limit of the cavernous sinus. It may also occur in other great vessels such as aortic arch, internal carotid artery or the innominate artery. The atheromatous plaques cause stenosis of the involved artery and the distal flow is significantly affected when the stenosis becomes 50 to 90 percent of the original diameter of the artery. When these atheromatous plaques ulcerate, emboli can originate from them and this may happen with any degree of stenosis. So the two roles of plaques are to cause stenosis of the artery and as a source of the emboli. Cardiac sources of emboli include atrial fibrillation, hypokinetic ventricular wall segments, valvular heart disease, endocarditis and myxoma. Treatment of TIA can be medical or surgical. Medical options include aspirin and or clopidogrel for carotid artery stenosis. For atrial fibrillation, direct acting anticoagulants are prescribed and they can be factor TDA inhibitors and thrombin inhibitors. And treatment of vascular risk factors, hypertension, hyperglycemia and hyperlipidemia are instituted. Surgical options include carotid and arterectomy to relieve the carotid artery stenosis and cardiac intervention for cardiac arrhythmias and other cardiac sources of emboli. So what is most important to remember is TIA is a medical emergency both retinal and cerebral and the cerebral type we will be discussing shortly because it has a risk of subsequent cerebrovascular accident in up to 15% of patients with retinal TIA within the first 90 days and half of the CVA episodes occurred within 48 hours. 
it is said that the combined risk of CVA and MI is 40% in the next 10 years. And the factors which increase the risk of a subsequent CVA after an episode of retinal TIA include male sex, age more than 70 years, history of previous cerebral TIA or stroke, intermittent leg claudication, carotid artery stenosis between 80 to 94 percent and absence of collateral vessels on cerebral angiography. There are other vascular causes of retinal TIA other than atheromatous plux and cardiac sources. They can be vasculitic such as GCA which must be excluded in all elderly patients because of its high risk of bilateral blindness, ocular hypoperfusion from early CRVO or ocular ischemic syndrome, internal carotid artery dissection, hyperviscosity disorders such as multiple myeloma, polycythemia vera and leukemia, hypercoagulability states such as antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, OCPs, hyperhomocysteinemia, deficiency of protein C, protein S and antithrombin and mutations in factor 5 and methylene tetrahydrofolate ductis. And there is a rare and a benign entity called central retinal artery vasospasm also known as retinal migraine which is thus a diagnosis of exclusion and the patients having retinal migraine have recurrent stereotypic episodes of monoocular transient visual loss. Workup of monoocular or unilateral TVL is directed towards retinal ischemia. We have to exclude ocular and orbital causes of TVL which we will be discussing shortly. We must exclude GCA, a very important diagnosis to exclude in patients older than 50 years or more, but it is unlikely if a visible embolus is detected. Physical examination includes looking for irregular pulse in arrhythmias, cardiac brew in valvular stenosis and carotid brew in carotid artery stenosis. But if the carotid artery stenosis is complete, the carotid brew may be absent and the patient must be urgently referred for carotid duplex ultrasound or magnetic resonance angiography or computer tomography angiography. These modalities of investigation will be able to detect atheroma, stenosis and dissection in internal carotid artery, common carotid artery and aortic arch. Transesophageal echocardiography will detect cardiac valvular and cardiac wall defects and aortic arch abnormalities. However, a normal report in a transesophageal echocardiography does not rule out a source of emboli. Alter monitoring is indicated when we suspect arrhythmias and a diffusion weighted imaging MRI of brain will be able to detect cerebral infarctions which are often symptomatically silent. Tests and investigations for blood pressure, blood glucose, lipid profile, coagulation profile and collagen vascular diseases are indicated as and when required. Cerebral causes of TVL result in homonymous visual symptoms on either the right or the left side of the visual field and migraine is the most common cerebral cause of a TVL and migraine causing TVL presents with a homonymous hemianopic aura which we have described in the previous session and these episodes of aura alternate sides in migraine the aura is gradual in onset and may last up to 30 minutes and is usually followed by a headache occipital mass lesions such as tumors and arteriovenous malformations can also cause TVL, however the episodes always occur on the same side. In a vertebral basilarity uterine TIA, the patient will complain of loss of vision in both the eyes, whereas in a posterior cerebral artery TIA, the patient will complain of homonymous loss of vision or loss of vision in only one eye whose temporal field is affected. Like retinal ischemia, they are also sudden in onset and lasts for a few minutes. These patients may also have headache usually in the brow contralateral to the field affected during the attack. Occipital seizures usually have positive unformed visual phenomena but may also have negative visual phenomena or blackouts. Occipital seizures usually last from seconds up to a few minutes and occipital seizures are usually benign in children but usually due to a mass lesion in adults. Non-retinal ocular causes of TVL include tear film disorder, pigment dispersion, angle closure, uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome, papilledema and optic disc drusen. And orbital SOL 
may also cause a transient visual loss which are typically gaze evoked when gaze is directed towards a specific direction because of neural compression and or vascular compromise by the SOL. Thank you for listening.